know what? I want to go back to one of the things that you said um, at the beginning when we when Wajid asked the question, well, why would you go into a nursing home? Like, why is that a business that you would get into? And the response that you gave was that, you know, a lot of these private equity firms go after low, low income, um, uh, I guess, needs, industries, places where these people go to. And I want to, I want to talk about that. And What is it? Because one of the things that I find, and I know that we are at a period in our society where we really do want to eat the rich, right? Where you have, you have, you have a a, a pocket, a pocket of people who are taking, you know, space shuttles to, you know, to outer space. And then you have people that can't put food on their table. The pandemic illuminated what many of us who've worked in justice areas have seen right for so long. And then it showed us like, look at, look at who you call essential when it's needed and then look at what is happening. And so, you know, when we see these things and I know that it's not just activism as a whole and your, and your book does a lot to illuminate this, but how do we make the correlation between these people, not necessarily, as you're saying, you know, oh, you talk to private equity people and they're not necessarily bad people, but they sure as hell are targeting communities that are marginalized and underserved. And when I see that kind of targeting, all I think about is bad, right? So I, I'm trying to understand, like, one, how do those that are being taken advantage of wait, like, are woken up to that consciousness, like understand that they are being taken advantage of. And then I guess if they are, then what recourse do people, do people Mm. have? Yeah, no, it's a great question. And I think it's a deep one about how does activism work on, on these sorts of issues. One of the challenges that we've got with private equity is it's everywhere and nowhere. Um, you know, private equity firms spent $1.2 trillion buying businesses in 2021. And yet, Mm. You know, it's very unlikely that you're going to see a company, you know, your veterinary clinic say that it's a Mars owned company or that your, um, you know, nursing home chain is a is a Carlisle business or something like that. Um, It's hard to to see where private equity is. Um, You guys are, you know, your podcast and others are sort of doing the hard work of helping to educate people about the idea of private equity and all the areas that it's spread. I, the, the thing that makes me hopeful is I have seen a lot of activism on specific issues where private equity is active. So mm-hmm. prison services, right. we just mentioned. And I have to say, I think actually activists are uniquely powerful on this on a, in a way that they aren't on some other economic justice issues. So just to make that very specific, private equity firms um, need to get their money from somewhere to buy up businesses. And they tend to get it either from sovereign wealth funds, which is other countries, or from pension funds. So, you know, the teachers Mm. union or the police union or whatever it happens to be. Um, Those institutions actually listen to their members and are susceptible to political um, pressure. And in fact, there have been pension funds that have withdrawn investments from private equity firms for various sort of political or moral reasons. So... I actually think that if people can um, sort of be made aware of how private equity is, is shaping their life, there's actually a lot of different ways that they, can, they, that they can sort of move the needle on the issue that they care about. And it's also so disgusting, right, that they raid pension funds <laughs> to, to fund future raids and pillages. Uh, and, and if these things go wrong, who gets screwed, Brendan, right? Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, no, you know, there's, there've been sort of funny stories about pension funds investing in private equity firms that ultimately, whose portfolio companies ultimately engage in anti-union campaigns. So there's sort of a, a snake eating its own tail sort of quality to it. I, I'd add, you know, the, the potentially concerning addition to that is, um, you know, those have been the historical sources of private equity money, but um, there's been a concerted push for private equity firms to get access to um, 401k funds. So, you know, Waj, he's very rich. He, he's, you know, cares about the carried interest loophole and such. I have 12 falafels in storage. Lots of invest, you know, lots of falafels, lots of investments. Um, his 401k money could potentially be um, pushed to invest in private equity firms in the next few years, thanks to deregulation that's happened over the past few so years. So I wouldn't know about it? Who would be it? making that? I was yeah, like, yeah, who, like, 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 both of us what? are like, wait, who would be making that decision? I'm going to go up, check my 401k right now with like, the $12 right now. in it. Yes. So it, it hasn't happened yet. So just to give you guys some color, wow. um, 
In 2019-2020, uh, um, the Department of Labor, in conjunction with the Securities and Exchange Commission, issued a letter that essentially insulated um, 401k investment managers from liability for investing in private equity firms. Now, there are any securities lawyer is going to quibble with some things that I just said there, but that's the, that's the short version of the story. Um, that letter has since been partially walked back, but not entirely. Um, what it means is basically private equity firms are now in sort of the active campaign mode uh, to try to get 401k money in the next few years. Paul McLeod at Capital Forum has done really important reporting on this. So, like, okay, let me let me let me pull pull myself back from from the edge because I want to scream. Um, what is the goal here, Brendan? Is it just like? Because at, at at some point, I we look at the politics of this, and I look at you know the the greed of it all, mm. and I'm thinking to myself, wow. So it's not enough to go after certain people's pensions because pensions really don't exist right in the United States the, in in the way that they did in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. That kind of was eroded uh, through through Reagan and the Republicans, right? It's, so it's inshallah work... pension, Daniel. Right. Inshallah yeah, pension, right? So so that's gone. You then have 401ks, which most or, you know, most companies and organizations, OK, maybe they do 5 percent. Maybe if you're lucky, they do 10 percent mm. investment on top of what you're already investing. And your hope there, right, is that at some point, uh, inshallah, you'll be able to retire at the ripe old age of 65 when, of course, you know, our life expectancy is backsliding. And that's been for the last three years. So maybe you get a good 10 uh, 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 of time. So now if they go after four, is it, is the goal just to bankrupt us all? Like, is the goal just to create like a permanent, like fiefdom underclass indentured servitude with the select 1% on top and the rest of us just unequivocally fucked? I don't think any of the private equity leaders think of themselves in such political terms. Mm. I think what they, I think many of the, you know, uh, the head of Carlisle group says that private equity is the world's uh, most noble profession. I'm paraphrasing. Wow. Quite <laughs> um, Did he write uh, that in the Bible? Face eating testament? leopard says eating faces are good for humanity. <laughs> you know, and it's vitamin funny, rich. Guy, yeah. He does have a sense of humor. He may have been saying it ironically. I don't know. I've only read the transcript, but he, um, uh, you know, the, the largest private equity firms have extraordinary ambitions. Um, KK, uh, KKR and Blackstone um, aim to have a trillion dollars in assets under management each in the next few years. Um, so we're, we're talking about, you know, um, uh, wealth that's on the magnitude of, you know, a small country. Um, so they, they, they certainly have big ambitions. It's, uh, you know, I go mm -hmm. back to what I said, supervillain. Uh, and and I was very aware of the the pirate language, but this is you know this is the it, for me at least, and and I only speak for myself, uh, Brendan. I hope democracy ish doesn't get uh, offended and and fire me, but this is you know human greed run rampant, right? Just yeah. when you can, instead of being content, you're like, well, why did why not? If I can get money from the nursing homes, if I could take money from the housing industry, if I could take money from healthcare, if I could take money from prisoners, let's do it. Uh, I want to go back to something that you said, because I want you to connect the dots for folks, right? The prison industrial complex. Uh, in the United States of America, we incarcerate uh, more than 2 million people, more than any other country on earth, right? Uh, it's, it's a very profitable industry that wrecks havoc um, on generations, on communities. Uh, when you talked about the, the phone, you know, both my parents were incarcerated once, so I'm very familiar with uh, the, just the struggle <laughs> to talk and how much it used to cost, right? People had no idea. Just connect the dots for us uh, about how private equity targeted the private industrial complex, uh, excuse me, the private prison complex, and how, like you mentioned, activists were able to fight back. I think if you can give us that narrative arc, it will be really helpful just to give us yeah. some hope. So private equity firms have been very interested in sort of every aspect of prison services. So you mentioned phones. Um, Securus, Global Telling have all at various times been owned by private equity firms. There have been serious accusations that they have significantly raised the rates to such an extent that at least in, in, in some places, I don't want to ascribe it to either of those two comp companies specifically, um, you know, it could cost $25 for a 15-minute call. Um, which is just pretty extraordinary for when you consider most people who are in prison. 
Um, but it's not just phones. Uh, private equity firms also got very interested in prison healthcare services um, mm. and bought up the leading leading prison healthcare services. There have been a lot of lawsuits um, against those companies. Um, there's a very tragic one, for instance, of a woman who was forced to give birth by herself alone in a cell because um, the contractor refused to provide her care. Um, and then sort of ancillary services that you might not think about. One is um, a prison release card, uh, which is Back in the day, if, um, you know, Danielle or I had to spend, you know, the night in jail for a DUI or something like that, I get picked up and, um, you know, I would give whatever cash was in my pocket to the, to, to the jail. When I came out in the morning, they'd give me the cash back. That was in the movies in the eighties and nineties. If you remember that, they used to show that. Yeah, exactly. The beginning of Ocean's Eleven. So, you know, like, um, but now if I were to go, you know, get a DUI and come out the next morning, uh, I wouldn't, in many places, I would no longer get cash. I would get uh, a debit card. Um, and that debit card would nominally have the money that I would have on it, but uh, there would be an activation fee. There would be a withdrawal fee. There would be a balance in a- I- inquiry fee. And as alleged, there'd even be an inactivity fee. Um, so that was that the company that was providing those was, uh, ultimately owned by a private equity firm. So it's an area where PE firms have been extremely interested. Um, as you said, there have been reasons for hope. A number of activist organizations have been extraordinarily successful at, um, prohibiting, um, private equity firms and their portfolio companies from gouging, um, prisoners on phone services specifically. There's been local legislation, there has been state legislation, and as of last year, there's been federal legislation, and I believe soon, perhaps, rulemaking at the FCC. And that's an area where I think activists were very smart to focus on a very specific, tangible issue. Um, and I was, I was talking to an older activist last night who's in her 80s, and she said, you know, it's, it's hard to have a movement if you don't have something to move. And, you know, they, ha- they had a specific solution in mind. And I think that was extraordinarily effective. 